for it on this computer. All right, cool. Well then, hello everyone, thanks. Welcome to the BRAID meeting. Really excited to see everyone here. So we've got uh, Dwayne, Seth, um, Bryn, and Bryn and Chris are, um, have been working together. I've been working with Dwayne, Seth, and Greg, who's the whale down there. And let's look at our agenda. Um, all right, so we just had a little meet and greet and now I'm gonna just give a quick intro on Braid. Then we're gonna go, the main thing is that we're gonna go through a bunch of demos and the work we've done on the last whatever amount of time. And then we're gonna have some discussion. Um, and in the discussion, we're gonna talk both about the protocol and how we can collaborate. Um, so we've got maybe two different definitions of Braid right now. In the protocol, we're creating, um, we're adding synchronization to HTTP. And in the big picture, what this is gonna enable is that you can just have state anywhere on the internet that you can grab and synchronize with and use it like a local variable. And so you can read and you can write it. Anyone can read and write it. And you can read and write it as a local variable and there'll be this abstraction behind the scenes that's gonna merge everything for you. And, and this is gonna be a real radical change in computing and programming. It's gonna make it so much easier to write your code. You don't have to care about networking at all. All the networking will be handled automatically. Um, and you're also gonna get a bunch of great features like you'll get offline mode built in and collaborative editing. Um, and so we're really stoked because we can add this to the web. And so the work in front of us to add this to the web, and we can do it in a backwards compatible way, involves four, four things that we have to be working on. And so we're pushing on all these fronts. Um, we need to have this in the protocol. And so, and that's actually, we've got a pretty good version of a protocol spec right now, which gives us a whole lot of great features. Then we also wanna be writing these libraries. And sometimes I've been calling this a, a kernel, like in an, an operating system has a kernel that abstracts the underlying hardware. We're, we seem to be writing software libraries that abstract distributed state and they abstract all the networking for you and just expose a local variable. And Bryn and Chris have been working on one called Redwood that they're gonna talk about today. We also are building apps and because in order to get, like our goal is to change the web and add this great functionality to the web. And that's only gonna work if a bunch of people are building apps that use this protocol extension. And so we're, uh, I think we're starting some work on some messaging apps um, this week and next week. And then we also have some new algorithmic work that needs to happen to make all this efficient, all the synchronization. We're gonna show a demo of that today too. Um, so, Together, um, this is all the stuff that we're working on. And um, it's a little bit hard to keep in mind sometimes, like what is Braid, is this a protocol? Is this a set of libraries or these applications or algorithms? All of these things are necessary because we have to build the software, the protocol and the ecosystem to push forward this new version of the web. Um, do you have any questions or thoughts from the group on what we're up to? Okay, um, so this is just a little, I, I, I like to refer to this roadmap when we think about how we're getting there. Today's HTTP, you can think of it as level zero, we're gonna, but we're adding some new features to it, like the ability to not just get a URL, but subscribe to it and have the server push you updates of new versions over time. And we've got a spec right now, which handles level one and level two pretty well. So we've also got patches and you can have multiple writers editing the URL and everyone can, main, can stay consistent. Off in the future, we're gonna be adding some, the next steps is, is to have peer-to-peer -peer validation, um, the ability to prune history while keeping peers up to date. And we also wanna have peer-to-peer -peer URLs and transport. So we're not relying on centralized DNS. And we can add all of these features to the web. And this will get, when we're at this level, this is gonna be kind of like everyone's dream of a decentralized web. But whereas a lot of other projects are trying to build a new decentralized web off on the side, we can just add all these features to the existing web. That's what separates us. Um, so that's a roadmap here. 
and um, I guess it's, it's time for some demos. So I'm going to start by showing this little test to server thing I made. Um, so if you are writing, a lot of us are writing some Braid server implementations. And you can go to this page now, braid.new slash test a server. And you can type the URL for your server into here. Um, and so this is some chat state. You click go, and now it subscribes to that state. And it will show you all the updates that happen over time. Let me make this a little bigger. So this is actually, this is the, um, this is the chat app. And the state of this is just an array. So you can see the state right here. This is saying that we're starting a subscription and the current version is version seven. And at version seven, it sets the entire chat to an array of messages. And we can now add a new message. And so this chat is connected to the server and this message just got sent as a patch to the server and it patched that array. And now we can see over on this, uh, and then the server then um, sent that to this test page. And you can see there's a new version, version eight, and it sets the end of the chat array to a new message. And so this is just a little test page. Um, this is speaking the, the Braid protocol within, uh, within some JavaScript. It's just a simple JavaScript extension um, to, and then, um, and so you can play with this now. It doesn't show a lot of, it's not fully featured, it doesn't show all the errors. Like, so if you're testing your server, it might be hard to debug, uh, but let me know, we can make this thing work better. Um, and then we can get some interoperability because we're all, we seem to be writing a number of different braid implementations now. So that's that demo. So just uh, to clarify there, Mike, um, yeah. so these, um, that URL that you typed in, Invisible College 377 chat, um, that's not being, that's not sent to the server to communicate behind the scenes. That's something that your browser is communicating to directly. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, this browser is doing a direct connection to this um, using, uh, it's a cross origin request. Cool. Right? So you, you have to, you want to enable cores on your server. Um, and uh, which is something we might be talking about in the future too. Um, it seems like for most of our Braid protocol, we could have cores be enabled by default so that you don't have to configure it um, because these apps are really useful to grab things at other servers. That still low-key low terrifies me, but <laughs> we can talk about that more later. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure that it's safe to do. And so, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a thing to talk through. We can add it to one of the agendas in the future. I love that <laughs> sure. up on it. Yeah, yeah. I would security stuff. I always have that. I don't know. There's some line that um, that just because you're not clever enough to think of a way to like break a system doesn't mean that there isn't one. Uh, but yeah, we can have a chat about it later. Sure. I'm keen. Great. Um, any other questions or thoughts on this demo? That's really cool. Uh, so, um, is that like? So you're using the the range range format there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Is it? Oh, okay. People have been using it. <laughs> 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 trying to get a someone's trying to hack us. That's. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I was gonna ask him. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't support all patch types. Yeah. But it, yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. It just supports the range patch right now. Okay, uh, well, let's move on. Let's see, next we've got uh, Dwayne, you've got a CPU temp system monitor demo, I think, to show. Yeah, let me give this a go. Hey, Share my screen. Uh, host Benjamin disabled participant screen well. sharing. I think I need okay. some permission. Yeah, you should have it now. Okay. Great. Looking good. Okay. So, um, same thing that uh, Mike was talking about is related to my presentation here. So the, the protocol levels that we're supporting is um, interesting to me because I want to I want to see what value I as a web developer can get at each level. And uh, so I'm I'm currently focused on level one here subscriptions with push updates. Um, so uh, I intro this on our uh, braid HTTP uh, group our, our uh, email group. And 
<clears throat> basically what this is, is I'm trying to sort of take the perspective of a web de of a developer who has some web experience, what would it take to build uh, a subscription using something like Svelte, um, could be React, uh, what would this look like? So here, here's what it here's what it does look like. Um, and I'm going to show you the repository here. Um, so you could uh, get clone this. And um, I'm going to do that in a second. But I also wanted to point out that um, I'm relying uh, very heavily on um, Ceph's braid protocol uh, uh, repository here. And it's, um, I, I think he would probably say that it's rudimentary. It's not fully supported yet, uh, all, all the levels, but I'm relying on that level one subscription uh, capability. So uh, I'll go to iTerm here and uh, clone this raid system info. And then uh, I'm intentionally showing you what you would need to do so that it isn't intimidating, hopefully, to, do, to try it yourself and kind of tinker around and play with um, braid subscriptions. So this is also relying on uh, something called uh, system information, which is an NPM package that has a ton of uh, things that you can subscribe to from your own system, file system, CPU, BIOS, there's a whole bunch of things. But I'm just relying on the uh, CPU temperature, um, which I believe, yeah, this, this guy right here. Uh, so here I'll just yarn start, and this runs a uh, server on port 2000. So I'll open up this and go to localhost 2000, and I get a date time and CPU temperature. You can see that temperature is high right now because we're using video chat. It's usually around 60 degrees. And um, what I also wanted to show here is that um, so the underlying uh, queries that it's making are uh, just regular H HTTP. So if I load this up, uh, oh, can't be reached. It crashed. Yep, I crashed it. OK, so you can't actually load it up as a regular HTTP right now for some reason. Um, but the intention is that you should be able to uh, load that value. You should just get a, a single integer or floating point value and um, ignore all of the rest of the, the uh, subscription information. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show that right now. So I'll have to demo that another time. OK, I think that's it. Is there any questions um, around implementation or uh, libraries or anything like that? Yeah, I was kind of curious to see the code that powers yeah. that, maybe just So this is the client side code um, calling uh, listen from the Braid protocol library on a particular URL. And then uh, it's a for await. So it's uh, asynchronously awaiting on any new values. And with the way that Svelte works, um, these uh, variables that are let bound inside of this script will be um, modified and uh, the, the corresponding HTML will be updated whenever that changes. Did you want to see the server as well, or? Uh, sure, yeah. Show that off. Uh, so the idea here is uh, this is a regular, this is very much like an express server. Um, it's called Polka. It's just a little bit simpler. Um, we, we're adding course uh, requests, and then these assets, which are the HTML files, CSS and HTML. And then we have two dynamic uh, requests. So we can um, provide the CPU temperature and the time as two different endpoints on this URL. And this, um, these things, CPU temp and time, are uh, what I'm calling subscribable values right now. I think they'll probably be uh, abstracted into something a little bit more like braid-like uh, once they can have you know, updates, patches, things like that. But at this point, it's just a subscribable value. And what a subscribable value does is it just keeps track. First of all, it interprets, is this a, an HTTP request that has a subscribe? If it isn't, it just responds as a regular HTTP, which, by the way, is the part that failed in my demo. Um, and if, it's, if it does have a subscribe, then it uh, will continually add um, patches as these values update. 
this is the subscribe value, and it needs to keep track of each of the um, each of the clients uh, uh, streams so that it can keep adding those values to each of the streams, no matter how many clients there are. Yeah, this is really cool. I have written some similar code, but in slightly different ways <clears throat> using mm -hmm. like Express instead of Polka, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it'd be, be kind of fun to just compare our code at some point. Yeah, it would. I'd like that. Cool. Thanks for watching, everyone. That's awesome. Thank you, Dwayne. OK, uh, looks like Bryn, you and Chris are up next. Cool. I'd also um, be happy to do a little demo if, if people can oh, try great. it on the agenda. But... Yeah, why don't you go after Bryn? Sure. All right. Have you guys seen that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have also uh, been working with Chris on a chat app. Um, that was intentional. Uh, I think we were as a group, we're kind of doing what is known as the Toyota model, um, parallel development. Uh, and so the way I've done this is a bit different, I think, from the way that Mike did his. Um, and maybe it's best for context if we start uh, with what the underlying node software is. So I've been working on this thing called Redwood for about a year and a half. Um, really started right around the time that I met uh, Mike and Greg at DWeb. Um, and uh, so it is a, it's an implementation of the, the braid protocol with a few other things bolted on. Um, it has its own uh, sort of peer to peer paradigm. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it is an application server as well. So you can load it up with state as well as uh, assets for your application. And it's just sort of a, an out of the box backend. Um, it's really aimed at uh, web developers, JavaScript developers. Um, as we'll get into in a minute, uh, the way that it handles state updates, uh, it, I actually have it linked to V8. Uh, and so V8 executes these merge resolvers when, uh, when you send updates to it that decide how to modify the state tree. Um, so it should be really approachable for, yeah, for JavaScript developers. Uh, there is a sort of, uh, well, it's, it's not really up to spec at the moment, but there is a client right now. I've renamed it because it's not truly braid at the moment to redwood.js. And so this is what you would use to interact with the with the node. Um, let's see anything else. It draws a lot from my background in uh, blockchain. Uh, so all of the all of the updates are signed with a um, cryptograph <coughs> excuse me cryptographic key. Um, let's see here. Yeah, that's probably enough context for now. There's some demos in the repo, if anybody is curious, um, under here. And the one that I'm going to be showing you with Chris today is this uh, desktop chat app. So let's see here. Uh, OK, Chris, do you want to go ahead and connect your node to mine? Yeah, I'll go ahead and restart it. I, yeah, I'll restart it right now. Yeah, so we are connected directly uh, with no intermediary. Uh, let's see here. It supports um, uh, NAT, so it can get through most home routers, but I am currently running it through an Ingrock tunnel um, just for reliability's sake. OK, I am connected. Okay. Cool, I'll see you. Uh, OK. So just to sort of uh, explain what you're looking at here, the app is uh, over here on the left, and the state trees are, are going to render over here on the right. Um, and you'll notice this toggle metadata button. 
Uh, this allows me to hide these fields that, uh, that essentially define uh, how updates to the tree are merged and validated. Um, so we can just focus on what the actual data is. So let's see, first of all, uh, you'll notice that when I, uh, when I choose a server, uh, the application spins up a bunch of new subscriptions to, um, to all of the state trees that, I, that it is aware of. Um, and it's aware of them because I've told it to be through uh, some of these. Let's see here, add a server. We can do anything. Let's do break.news. Okay, and so you'll notice that updated this state. And I click on it. Uh, then it subscribes to the registry of chat rooms. Uh, and then I can create a new chat. You'll see here another state tree. And when I send a message, it updates the state tree again. Uh, so all pretty straightforward. Uh, and Chris is seeing the same thing on his end. Um, so when we go in here, you can see it supports uh, file uploads. Like I said, you can, you know, you can host assets of any kind on it. Um, yeah. Let's see. Hi, Chris. You're going to scroll down. Yeah, we are, Chris. Yeah, so we're talking directly, peer to peer, uh, over the Brave protocol. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's pretty much that. Um, a question for you. You've mentioned state tree a couple of times. Is there any special meaning to that? Uh, not particularly. So the, the whole model is kind of, like I said, it's oriented towards web developers. So a state tree is kind of what you would be used to if you used uh, React and Redux, for example. Okay. Uh, and I can actually show you, hopefully it will continue sharing. Are you all seeing the uh, code now? Yeah. Let me blow that up a little. So I created a React hook here that should make this really easy um, for anyone who works in this kind of paradigm. Uh, all you have to do is say use state tree and then give it the, uh, the URL of the tree that you want. And anytime that the tree gets an update, <clears throat> it just re-renders the component. Uh, and the stuff that's coming through this hook is exactly what you see over here. Um, let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to show you guys. I think it could be helpful there to, to just use the, like it, that's the same, I'm pretty sure that's the same HTTP concept as a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, so it might be, I, I think it could be helpful to use the same vocabulary for these things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I've, I've kind of, um, I've been off in a cave, as I mentioned to you guys last time. So there's definitely some harmonization that we can do. Um, <clears throat> so just peeling back uh, the layers of this hook, uh, it's, I mean, it's really simple. It just does a subscribe, which is, uh, uh, you know, the subscribe that you see in the braid spec. Um, you give it what I'm calling a state URI, but what uh, Mike correctly pointed out should probably be called a resource. Uh, you can give it a key path if you want it to filter that for you. Uh, and then you can tell it if you only want each successive state or if you also want the transactions, uh, which are um, essentially the updates that are sent to the, to the node. Uh, and so it creates a subscription. And then every time it gets, uh, every time the callback fires, it just updates the tree and sends it, sends it straight to you. Um, so it's all very simple thanks to the elegance of the protocol. Um, so yeah. That's really Any nice. Any other questions? Thanks. What do you want to do with this eventually? Like, how are you imagining it, you know, people using it? Uh, I mean, it's a pretty big space of possibilities. I, you know, I think it was, it was wise to start 
uh, with something like chat, like we've all done here, um, provides immediate value. But I'd like to see it uh, used as kind of a more general web backend, um, as well as kind of a way of, of uh, I mean, it's, it's not just a backend, right? It's, it's also like a client in a sense. It's, uh, it's a way that you navigate this peer-to-peer -peer network and, and consume content from it and uh, decide which content you want to cache locally. Um, so there's, you know, there's sort of no limit to the things that you could build with it. Uh, if you go to the repo, it just lists a few of, uh, of the possibilities here. So traditional web apps, collaborative document editors, peer-to-peer uh, -peer encrypted messaging. You could build blockchains with it. I, um, I said to Mike jokingly, maybe about a year ago, that I wanted to rebuild Bitcoin inside of it as a joke. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I think it could be done if the merge resolver was like proof of work or something. <laughs> um, and then Git style version control systems. And there are actually examples of a few of these. So uh, in the demos folder, there is a real time collaborative document editor, chat room, Git integration. It can serve as a, yeah, like a Git backend. Uh, and then Chris and I worked really hard uh, earlier. Let's see, I guess it was about May of 2020 on a video chat app. Um, so it turns out it can support that as well. Uh, although we never got the performance where we needed to. Um, but yeah, I could, I could really see it being used for all these things. Was it sending video over the protocol or just using the protocol to establish a video connection? Uh, it was using, so, you notice the thing about the uh, like the that fact that it can store assets. So what we were doing was um, we were taking the output of either uh, the, the browser video API in one case or um, Streamlabs OBS in another case. And so you just get these binary blobs. You upload them like you would upload a you know an image or a HTML file or something. And then in the tree, uh, the tree basically represents the sequence of, of blobs uh, that in the order that the client should consume them. Um, ben had well, some thanks. questions to the Austin chat. Um, ben, do you wanna do you wanna pop up in Austin? Yeah sure. All right, hold up. I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, hey, everyone. So would you compare Redwood to Hypercore's Hyper-B or IPFS or BitDB or Fauna, Textile or Mongo's Realm? Uh, all of the above, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the binary blob layer is a lot like IPFS. Um, the state tree is kind of like a, you know, it's like a document database like Mongo. Um, yeah, I forget all the ones you mentioned, but it, it definitely draws from from a lot of those and kind of tries to give you just an all in one uh, solution. So you're not configuring a bunch of infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, Redwood's actually, I think, how I found uh, Braid. So. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, yeah. All right. So, second question um, How does the peer discovery work? I think in the demo, it's just going to chat.local. Um, but what are some decentralized or federated or distributed approaches to that? Like, how could you implement that on top of Bray? Yeah. Um, so right now, the peer-to-peer -peer layer doesn't have a whole lot to do with Braid. Uh, it's using libp2p. Uh, and then I also wrote up an HTTP implementation that can essentially function in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Uh, as far as peer discovery, you know, you can, you can list some bootstrap peers in uh, in each of the state trees, if you want, that tell you, you know, this is where you can generally always find this, uh, this data. Um, it also supports MDNS. So if you're on a LAN or something, uh, you don't, you don't need any bootstrap peers. Um, oh, yeah. And then there, there was one other detail that I think we'll probably want to talk through in the, uh, in the mailing list or something. Uh, Mike suggested that we use the alt service header uh, for for essentially gossiping information about peers that each node is aware of. 
Uh, so every time you make a braid HTTP request, one of the headers is alt service and it's full of uh, peer connection info and seemed to work pretty well. Um, the header gets kind of big, but you know. Cool. Uh, so two other things that uh, seem similar. One would be a secure Scuttlebutt or Patchworks client for it. Uh, and another one is uh, Cabal Chat, which I only found out about two weeks ago. Um, and both of them have like a subjective interpretation to like blocking and moderation. So instead of there being like a, you join a group and then that group's are kind of moderate, instead you moderate things on yourself. So it's kind of like a, I guess, subjective reality that you enforce uh, onto you, the information you receive. Um, I guess in a distributed uh, or decentralized uh, protocol, that would kind of have to be the way to approach uh, moderation or blocking or filtering, muting. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I envision that there will be apps built on this that have kind of more traditional, uh, you know, moderation um, capabilities. Uh, it, it would kind of be opt-in on the application level, but yeah, at the plumbing level, yeah, pretty much all you could do is uh, specify some kind of filtering function uh, for, for content that you don't want, don't want to see. I mean, more generally, right? Like what you said, uh, you know, a subjective view of reality, like what compared to an objective view of reality, like that's not <laughs> something that exists, right? Like it's just a question of whose subjective reality is it Twitter's subjective reality or Facebook's or Reddit's or your own application, your own communities. And like from that perspective, I don't know, I can see something like this is like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, small communities can define their own rules and their own expectations socially and culturally. Um, right. Yeah, perhaps uh, individual versus communal would be uh, more appropriate terminology. Yeah, I think of it more as like, I personally like, <laughs> are you part of a, like, is it a feudal system where like the local lord gets to decide, you know, like what's true? Uh, or is it something that you have some sort of, you know, interactive uh, relationship with? But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so another question, uh, and my final one that has popped into my head is the, um, with secure scuttlebutt uh, or patchwork being a competitor to that chat prototype, uh, with scuttlebutt, one of the issues is you kind of have to download the entire universe of peer data uh, to kind of bootstrap the application. Uh, would Redwood support, because one of the uh, things that were nifty to me about Braid when I read through the protocol is it only needs to keep the uh, append log uh, while there is clients that depend on that uh, previous version data. And it could time that out and then just keep the latest data. Uh, would this also then apply to Redwood or in general to Braid apps where, hey, instead of having to keep every single uh, patch, we could just uh, keep the latest and kind of continually to trim or prune that history? Yeah, definitely. Um... I, you know, one of the goals with this is to ensure that it can work on like a, a phone, for example. Um, so it's been part of the roadmap for a long time uh, and it's under active development. So there are a few pieces already built that will help facilitate this. Like you, um, it, it does uh, state snapshotting uh, or checkpointing, however you want to think of it. Uh, another piece is like you said, um, the pruning stuff that Mike and Greg have been working on, that's not, in here yet, um, but it will be, uh, hopefully in the next couple months. And then I also, I guess the third approach is that uh, I'd like to come up with a way of uh, having a node be configurable as like a light client, sort of. Like it can, it, in the sense that it can ask for a state snapshot from a peer and then only require the, uh, the you know, subsequent updates after that snapshot. And then, you know, maybe you can, every time there's like a, a new snapshot, it can just get rid of everything prior to that. Um, so it's kind of, you know, still being played around with, uh, not sure of the correct approach, but I think it's pretty important. Yeah, well, the next demo we'll be talking yeah. about that stuff too, so we can continue oh, cool. that conversation. <laughs> nice. Cool. Sure. Is all you had done? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, well, I have one more question, but I can save it uh, until later because it's it's more general 
uh, a general question. Some really cool work, Bryn. Nice job. And Chris. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Um, and I, I just, um, I have uh, three. So one thing that's coming up, I think, Bryn, you know, you've been working on this for a long time. And I think for a while in the past, the, like maybe in the last year, the braid group has been more dispersed. And now that we're coming together, um, I think a big priority for us is going to be figure out how to integrate and interoperate. And that's something that you wanted to bring up later on too. And just after looking through that demo, like these thoughts are coming up with me and I'm seeing three ways that we'll probably want to be focusing on. And um, one way that we could like bind more is you've got a chat app, we're building chat apps and we can just try to make our chat apps work together. And that's like, you know, very immediate. Um, and then the second thing that's coming up is that in the process of developing this, you have, um, you're coming up with some abstractions for things like the state tree and the key path. And I think we're all like, can feel the desire for those things. It's like they're natural entities in the world of programming, but we're using different terminology for them and representing them in slightly different ways. And so we can just have like an abstract discussion, I think about these different concepts. And it might be nice even to just lead with, here's the stuff that you've built for Redwood. And then, we can just like, what is this? And how do we think about it? And maybe even write down our thoughts in some shared document. And that could be a really cool thing we could do too. Um, and then the last thing that's coming up is that you've also been developing some stuff that goes far beyond um, other stuff that we've discussed as a group yet. Like there's a level three and level four protocol items in here, like peer-to-peer -peer transport. And that's like, um, you know, the group can really benefit, I think, from seeing a sketch of what you've designed and developed because that can also stretch our minds and we can be like, okay, you know, here's a possible future. And then as we are de designing and finding consensus on the earlier stages, we'll have an idea of what we can grow into from this. And then it's, and that'll help us to the point where we do want to come together in consensus and spec out a protocol. Yeah, that sounds great. I, it, it makes me think that the first step is probably for me to put together some kind of design doc um, of what yeah. I've done. And then, you know, we can extract pieces of that that seem worth talking about. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that would help for both the second and the third thing. You know, that would be like a design doc so we could look at here's those concepts and also here's how you've implemented these advanced peer-to-peer -peer features. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did, with, I did with Kevin, who's the author of YJS. Um, we did a technical deep dive uh, what, a few months ago. And, you know, it was just like him and I on, you know, Mike was there for a little while uh, on Zoom and we recorded it and threw it on YouTube afterwards. but you know, like just going through like how the whole thing works, you know, went through a bunch of the code and different design decisions, chatted about different questions like that. And um, yeah, like if writing up a big design doc sounds exhausting, I'd be delighted to do something like that with you if you're up for it, Bryn, um, and just go through it in video form and conversation form. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if I could add to, I think that that's actually a really good idea because um, the, the purpose in this explication is gonna be to, for us to put pull into our brains too. And so if we do it, in a shared way, we might, you know, it might be more effective and easier and maybe more fun. <laughs> Probably a lot more fun. Yeah, agreed. Sounds good. <laughs> cool. Any other thoughts, questions on Britain's demo? Great. Well, that was really awesome. Um, I'm going to show now. Um, so the next thing we have is this algorithm. And oh, do you want me to? Do a demo oh, yeah, as well? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, right. your turn. Thank you. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, let me just screen share as well. I'll just screen share my whole desktop. I think that'll be fine. Uh, so, so this is using an older version. So this is something I made for a group that I've been doing some um, playing these games with. Uh, so I can, you know, this is the glass bead game timer. I can host a room. Uh, I've got this room and this is a shared timer. So, you know, if the, um, you know, I made this anyway, like this is something I wanted. So, you know, everybody who's in the room can see a timer going and then it, so that you can play a game with people over the internet. Uh, this is using an older version of the, well, I mean, an older version of how I was imagining the braid protocol. So this isn't up to up to standard of, you know, like where we're up to at the moment. Um, it's using service and events, but I just want to show you like a couple little bits and pieces. Um, so if I run my watch script on this URL, then I can see that, um, what I've got, and this is a very similar version to what Mike was showing earlier. Um, and I want to update this with all the more recent braid protocol stuff. Um, but I can see this is the object that the game is using to configure itself. This is just made in Svelte. So the 
status is that the game state is paused. The topic is time, hence the timer. You got 60 seconds per turn and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and let's say I um, go down and I reconfigure the game. So I want to make it so there's, you know, five players instead. And it's going to be, the topic's going to be, uh, it's going to be beauty instead. So we'll see, we're getting these updates uh, coming through and just setting the topic to be beauty. Um, this isn't actually currently merging exactly right. And I want to move across to the proper braid protocol to do this, but I thought it's worth showing because um, this is the kind of tooling that I want for braid itself. Um, so yeah, so I've got that and um, uh, and this is working pretty well. So I, again, like this is sort of in the ecosystem of tooling that I want to all be compatible with everything we're doing. So I'd love to, you know, once I move this across to using like actual braid instead of, you know, this, you know, older service and events based way of doing it. Um, this tooling should all just like magically work with everything Dwayne's working on and, you know, what Mike was showing before, which would be really sweet. Um, and the other thing I want to show briefly. Just out uh, of curiosity, did oh, yeah. you try um, did you try any other uh, sort of standard tools, and how far did you get, uh, like curl or NC or anything like that? Uh, just just curious how how like, far you, you can take a standard HTTP uh, tool like curl and then see braid information. Yeah, I mean, I would be able to show it here easily. I mean, you could curl. I'd have to set the header saying that I'm interested in subscriptions, but you should be able to get all of the information from a Braid server and just be able to see it all pumped out of curl. Um, we got to try that. Yeah. It's such an interesting question. <laughs> it takes probably 30 seconds to give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, this is using service and events. If we wanted to test that, we should do it with your, uh, your little bit of yes. code, Dwayne. But, Good point. Um, Good point. But it should work fine. I mean, just you know, curl dash x header equals our header uh, dash h and then for, you know, um, the thing saying I want subscriptions. Subscribe, keep alive, yeah. Subscribe, keep alive, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, but that'd be really sweet. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, but that, this is like, this is this. Uh, Maybe my, the other thing I want to- Sorry, follow up question on that. What oh, were yeah. you hoping this watch script tooling could do that curl couldn't do? Was it sort of this um, ability to show uh, the state, the current state? Yeah, yeah. So I, what I want is I want both the current state, which is apparently a little bit buggy, but I'll move across to the actual braid protocol instead of fixing it. Um, I want to see the version and I also want to like, so we've got the state updating uh, and I also want to see like the updates. So I can see that I'm getting, so like if I pointed this at a collaborative text document, I should be able to see that I'm seeing all of these like um, OT patches or whatever it is for the characters I'm typing. And I can also see the document itself updating. And what I'm imagining is like, um, when I'm working on a, you know, a front end project, I've got some state that the front end project is powered off. And with something like this, I, sh I wanna, you know, and then I've got the server that's also doing a bunch of stuff. Um, so in this case, for example, we see this active sessions field, which is uh, the server keeping everybody subscribed about the number of active clients that are on like subscribed to this document. Um, which is something I wanted for the game itself. So you could see how many players are in. So if I open up another client, I can see now I've got active sessions three. Um, but the, the um, uh, yeah, so I want this as a debugging tool, basically like a developing cool. tool. So I've got my server working. Uh, okay, cool. Is the state, does the state make sense? Is the state what I want the state to be? Yes. Okay, great. So that means that when there's a bug, the bugs in the client, not the server, uh, if the state makes sense. Um, you know, oh, the state doesn't make sense. All right, the client is, you know, is reflecting the state exactly. You know, it's showing what it should be given this current state. Oh, the problem's on the, obviously on the server. Um, so, um, yeah, awesome. that's that's the goal. Thank you. But yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, any other questions on this? I want to show something else briefly, but Mike, you muted. I just think it's really awesome to show to have demos on the command line to like. Like this is extending the web far beyond what we're used to the web being. And so, uh, yeah, that's all. I just think that's really cool. Thanks. Um, I was, I this was is curious also... real quick. Um, oh, yeah, go for do, it. You, do you have any kind of persistence layer or is this all held in memory for now? So the model that this this application is using, um, so it, is that the, I feel like there's like two different ways we can build applications with all of this. And one of them is what you're working on and also what I'm working on, I wanna show you. Uh, but like having a database and then the database exposes Braid 
And then any application can sit on that database and consume braid documents and modify them and everything else. And the documents can be persistent and they can be replicated and all sorts of things that the database can provide. And the other way of building applications, um, which is I think like how Mike's built his chat application, how I built this glass bead timer, is that you write a braid server from scratch. Like the, the server code's custom each time. And then when you wanna have data that can be subscribed to, you say, hey, this field here can be subscribed. So the way that say Dwayne, like Dwayne's not using any database for his little um, CPU temperature monitor. That's just simply like taking a value that it already has and exposing it out over the network. So other peers can, you know, in, in his case, subscribe to it. Um, so this is using that second model of just having like a custom server. But I don't think that the future looks like writing a custom server for every application. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine and she was telling me why she was excited for Braid. She was like, yeah, I just want to, I just want my variables to outlive my program. That's like, that's what I want. You know, I don't want a database. I don't want queries. That's like, I, I can use those. I can put up with those things. But the thing I'm trying to solve is I want my variables to outlive my program. Um, and as far as that, that's what you want. Yeah, I, I think the future looks like some database -y tools. But yeah, this isn't using that right now. Um, does that answer your question? I feel like I... Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other thing I want to show briefly is the start. And this is very much prototype stage. Um, I was goofing around with like, what would it take to be able to have a database that could support uh, branches the same way that we do with Git? Um, so I went through a huge number of iterations on this code base, on this code. This file is completely self-contained, but um, what it supports is this is a little in-memory store that can have a set of documents and we can have changes to those documents. This is using a consistency and concurrency model of um, the way that React works. So uh, whenever you do a write, the write that you specify specifies which version it obsoletes. Um, and if there's two concurrent writes for documents, so the documents are version A and two writes come in both saying that they obsolete version A um, and then their versions B and C, then now the document is in a, um, uh, like a conflict state. I'm not sure what the word for that is, but if you do a fetch, then you get both document B and document C um, with their versions. And when, when you in turn do a write, you have to say, my write now supersedes documents versions B and C, and then that will make the document only have one value again. Um, this is like a ground layer that on top of which you could build CRDTs, but it's not very efficient for CRDTs. Um, but all of the other systems can be implemented on top of something like this. Um, so, so this is like a fuzzer to check that all of my um, code works correctly. So in this fuzzer, we've got a few different uh, branches inside the database and each of those branches accepts writes. Then all the branches merge with each other. So all of the peers which are sitting on those different branches do merge operations. And we make sure that after everything's merged, then the outcome's correct. Um, and uh, which was a ridiculously large amount of work. Um, uh, Oops, why am I not in the directory I'm expected to be? Um, uh, but, oops, um, but this works and it's doing a huge number of checks, but um, so this is a fuzzer showing that my consistency model is correct, which it is, uh, which is great. Um, and then on top of this, I've been making a little, um, a little server. So I can set a value. So like if I want to set, um, well, actually I'll show you fetching first. So if I fetch a document, I want to get at um, uh, raw slash braid, I can run that. I get the value of null. Uh, we've got a version. Um, and so this isn't using braid properly yet, um, but uh, we've got a version. So all the documents here are versioned. Um, I can do a write. And if I want to, I can do that write specifying that it's, over, uh, it's overriding the value with this version. Um, so if I set on document braid and the key is, you know, parties and the values, whoa, dude. So we're gonna set this JSON value. If I run this, um, oops, sorry. That's a bug at the moment. Sometimes it crashes. The crash isn't my code, it's in, I'm using LMDB. Oh, no, it hates me. Um, is it gonna keep on crashing? No, we're okay now. I, uh, there's some bug in LMDB. Um, I'm <laughs> getting seg faults in Node, which means it's, it's definitely not my fault, I swear. Um, anyway, uh, so I've set this value. I can obviously get it again, uh, except it's ever, uh, sorry about this. Yeah, so I'm getting back the value I'm expecting. Um, I can also use the same watch command to be able to subscribe. So if I watch instead raw slash uh, braid, then I'm seeing this value, parties, woe dude. 
And if I do writes to this, then, um, oops, sorry, uh, too many things open. Um, if I set this in third parties, uh, uh, awesome. Then the value updates as we expect. Um, so this is just doing a subscribe. Um, and the code itself is not exposed to the web API, but it also supports bouncing between different branches. So currently the model is that I've got, um, I've got an operation log the same way that I do in Git. So I've got all the operations going back in history forever. Then I've got a branch and a branch points at some particular point in time. And I have a view and a view is uh, like, you know, a, a view of the entire world at some particular point in time. So a view is at some branch. And I could say, I would like my view to instead move to this other branch, to this other point in time, and it'll go through all the changes it needs to make to be able to um, realize that different point in time. So then when we fetch or if we subscribe to documents, suddenly those documents will pop into being the value that they are at the different branch we move to. So yeah, any this questions? Is really exciting. This is, um, when, I, when I look at this, I'm seeing like um, probably what the, it looks a lot like what WebDAV was trying to be, I think. Mm. But I think WebDAV got some of the designs not quite right, you know, so it's not something that I've, we wanted to use. And one thing in particular here is this model of, of branching, I think is something we don't have that in the protocol right now. And we need to figure that out. I think that's probably coming up right now. So it'd be really good to have some time to hash through how branching should work. And yeah. Yeah, really? I'd love to have that conversation. I'm not sure if branching fits inside Braid or if it should be like this particular application uses branching and this one doesn't, or like what the relationship is there. But I think there's some, in, in particular, um, in the Braid spec, there is the notion of a current version. Mm. And like if you send a put it to the server, it'll update the current version. And that current version depends on a branch. And so, right, right? if you want to add a new version, it, it shouldn't add it to some other branch. And so, and you probably also want to be able to talk to a server explicitly and just be like, have a standard way to say, I want the branch named this or the branch named that, or I want to switch to this branch or that branch. So it seems like there'd be some protocol stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I look forward to having that conversation. <laughs> I've got some ideas. Great, I'm taking notes on things to do, <laughs> things to talk about next. I just want to throw out there that it, uh, although there would be some extra effort to like keep track of branches, the actual, the core code wouldn't need to change at all. It just has a, a list of versions and you could, as easy, like currently when you read the current version, it reads the, the merger of the leaf versions, but you can decide what you want to read and you could imagine you have a node here and you have two branches of versions that build on each other separately. They don't, um, and there's nothing about the, the algorithm that cares it, you can add things wherever you want into that tree or you can read whatever version you want. So I think um, you're talking about sync nine. Clip. Yeah, I am. And I, I understand that anyway, I'm just saying that the, uh, the underlying technology doesn't have any, any problem with branches. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, that's my interpretation too. Like I'm, I don't know, I've got a big laundry list of things that I add to this and. I spent all of yesterday porting, because this code's reasonably simple, porting it across to Rust. Um, and I have that working, but the HTTP API isn't finished yet and it doesn't do um, persistence, which this current code does. But um, yeah, I, I'm hopeful that I can extend that consistency model to support Sync9 and support YJS and so on and that should work. But um, yeah, yeah, it feels like they should, that should be fine. So do you have an authentication layer to this? And if you don't, how would you imagine that would look like? Uh, not yet. So I haven't spent the year that Prince worked, a year and a half that Prince worked on Redwood. Um, the authentication system I'm imagining is capability-based. So I haven't implemented it yet, but I've got plans in my head. And what I'm imagining is something like, um, uh, so like use cases, I wanna have, um, for example, uh, my note-taking application should work on my laptop and my phone and my other devices. And ideally, I want to be able to take this one document I have and share it with Mike, so he can work. He can collaboratively work on it with me. Um, so for that to all work, I'm imagining a capabilities-based model where um, each peer on the network has a key, and then um, when that peer requests operations or sends operations, it can send, say, here's my key, and then part of the data 
space and part of the data model would be a list of all of the keys and what access rights they have, um, you know, which wouldn't be part of the branches. It would probably be separate so that you, so that the keys are across all branches or something. Um, but then the idea is that if I want to add another peer, then, you know, there'll be some back and forth, but effectively we generate a new key for that peer and then we add it into the list of, um, uh, you know, the list of known, you know, like the client with this key has these access rights um, and that's stored. And then of course that'll be replicated to all peers as well. So, you know, there's still the active discovery problem of how we find each other. Although I've got, I don't know, this cool stuff in Hyperswarm that we came to play with. Um, but then the idea is that, um, yeah, if you've got that capability, you can, you know, come in and say, hey, I want to make this change. I've got this capability. And then your operations get signed with your private key. Um, and also uh, other peers know who you are. So. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other questions before we move on? Ben, you mentioned a couple of things in the chat. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in a braid world, I think this was kind of touched on with the authentication, but is there, how would we prevent spam or like someone just pumping tons of messages uh, into it and kind of overwhelming our little device? Is the way we would do that is kind of only subscribing, like uptaking and downloading uh, patches from peers that we trust? I'll just respond a little bit on this. Um, yeah. And so there, uh, I don't think that we've fleshed this all out yet. So I can scope out a little bit of my mind and other people can chime in with how they can look at this too. Um, the way I look at this is especially that we don't have peer to peer messaging yet. So in the, in the Braid protocol, we're just connecting to a server. And you know, our, we don't have it specced out. We don't have it standardized. Bryn has of course been developing some peer to peer messaging layers and you can totally do that. Um, but as far as the standard goes, which is level one, level two, um, you're going to have a server involved and then you can do the same sort of request restrictions or uh, throttling. What do they call that? You know, you, you prevent a certain number of requests per second from an IP address. Rate limiting. Rate limiting. Yeah. So rate limiting is a really common way to do that on servers today. So you can totally apply that. Um, and you might do a similar thing in a peer to peer network. Um, and I think what you mentioned in the chat, I think something about uh, peers that you trust. And I could totally imagine part of the state that we share in this peer-to-peer -peer network is which IP addresses do we trust? And then you can list, you can, for any IP that you do trust, you can look and see which things, which IPs they trust and start to build some kind of spam prevention network in that way. That is something that email servers do right now with IP blacklisting and there'll be a few different blacklist servers that the email servers will subscribe to, to know which IPs to trust to receive email from, you know, and it's kind of like a so-so solution. We can probably do something a little bit better just by having all of this information being shared and synchronized in a more open way. Because with the Braid protocol, uh, you have like the parents building up the tree uh, and you could probably, I imagine, uh, only merge uh, the, you know, build a, fork of the tree with only the peers you trust. So peers you don't trust or have been problematic, you just, they kind of go on their own divergent tree uh, and you can maybe call that the 4chan tree and then you have the, the Reddit tree <laughs> of like the ways a conversation could go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, like my take cool. is just security doesn't change because we've got braid. Like, you know, yeah. how does it work on the web? Well, I don't accept rights on my server from people I don't trust at the end, you know? Um, how does it work? Like, I think that MongoDB made a huge mistake by having rights turned on by default, and that's caused all sorts of security problems. The database I'm building, um, you know, obviously right now there's no authentication, but the goal would be that, you know, if when I hit 1.0, the default is that rights and reads are private by default. Um, yeah. You have to explicitly turn that on and explicitly decide who you're going to allow to read documents and who you're going to allow to write them. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to open that to the world, then that's, that's on you. But um, yeah. yeah, people don't usually do that for a good reason. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's that type of uh, controlling who writes and who doesn't requires you to kind of trust a, uh, what is it, a custodian of of who decides who, is that the word, or, or an arbiter of who's doing accepting yeah. what. Whereas I think it would be interesting that idea of well, if the people we reject or I reject, they can continue with their own tree of uh, of data. Yeah, totally. I think that's maybe a level above just um, like DDoS prevention. 
that's yeah. like um that's that's getting into mo content moderation and censorship i think yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, i'd love for my blog for example to have it so that um uh i can have write uh, read access so anyone can read the you know like the full braid history and clone it so if you want to you can clone my blog and then you can delete all the content and edit you know write your own content in there and then like you've got it's like a fork right like a fork with git that you've made a fork of the blog and then ideally like you know maybe you could clone my blog and then make some changes to something and then submit a patch request like a pull request on a post oh. you know you see a you see a typo you can send me a change and my server doesn't trust you so my server doesn't accept that change by default but you know maybe there's a, a way to be able to say hey like i'll accept pull requests and then i get an email saying you know I, however it works and then i can go through and say hey yeah, thanks thanks for that typo fix like move most that in and now my blog's got your change too. Mm. You could That'd probably use that same model for like verified comments, like, you know, comments that you thumb up or give the verified tick, then they get, you know, they're all comments from people you trust, they get shown first. Yeah. Mike's got a bunch of ideas about this. <laughs> <laughs> Very interested in building this stuff as some of our first applications actually. So um, uh, Ben, you're going down similar lines of thought. I'll probably want to talk to you afterwards and uh brainstorm with you and see yeah be good yeah uh so i see uh two, some other people have some questions too in the chat uh so one my last question on on this kind of subject is it was talked about for mobile embedded devices now in the scuttlebutt community they found that the javascript implementation wasn't giving them the performance they needed so they're moving to uh they're rewriting everything with rust which they imagine will take like one or two years uh, now, there's other things like the Web3 community. They're, they're, uh, there's one called Web3 API, and they're using assembly script, which is TypeScript to uh, WASM compiler. Uh, is the same idea going to happen with Braid and these, uh, the Braid ecosystem, where it's going to be compiled to WASM or it's going to be written in Rust to kind of get that mobile performance? So luckily, that doesn't have to impact the protocol. And so implementations can do whatever they want for performance. Um, and so we can kind of do that in a distributed fashion. And that does sound like a pretty good performance idea. Um, and so I think it sounds, and also it sounds like, so far it sounds like Seth and Bryn are the most performance, high performance oriented uh, kernel hackers that are interested in running that kind of thing. Yeah, for patch types. So I've written a lot of uh, like JSON operational transform code and things like that. Um, so JSON OT, YJS, auto merge all currently have JavaScript implementations. Um, I would, yeah, and uh, Sync9. Um, I would love all of these things to have like a nice clean um, implementation in Rust so that we can compile that to WASM and then use the patch type, like the same, literally the same code on our servers, on our clients, on our mobiles, everything else um, through WASM. I think that'd be a really nice way to do it. That, make, that makes sense. Uh, when I was talking to Kevin, uh, Jan's YGS uh, guy about this, <clears throat> excuse me, his protocol is very well optimized for JavaScript. He spent a ton of time uh, trying to get YGS as fast as possible in JavaScript. And he didn't think he could get any faster, um, but he saw about a 10x performance in increase when he moved to WebAssembly. So it's definitely there for the taking if you want it. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I, I, yeah, I've ported my my JSON, sorry, my plain text OT code, I ported, I hand ported it to, um, I use that as my like, you know, I'm just learning a new programming language. I port this code code each time to see how it compares. So I've got it in Swift and Rust and Go in C in um, JavaScript and TypeScript. Uh, anyway, the, the JavaScript version runs, I think it's about 100,000 transforms a second and the C code runs 20 million a second. So. Um, Sweet. Oh, wait, that's, how, that's how, fast is, how fast is the WASM version of it? Um, I don't think I ever compiled the C to, to WASM. The Rust implementation ended up being slightly slower just because I was using slightly less optimal string types and there was a couple more allocations. But I mean, the, the Rust code was the same length as the TypeScript code, like the same number of lines of code as it was in TypeScript and the, with basically the performance of C, which is amazing. Um, and my experience with WASM is that it runs like about 20 or 30% slower than, than the native version um, from some other code that I've ported to WASM. Uh, so that's kind of what I expect. Um, but WASM runtimes are getting faster anyway, but it's pretty close to native. 
So yeah, I guess it'd be like 15 million a second instead of 20 million a second in C. Uh, yeah. Cool, well, let's let's move on so that we can get through everything in time. Um, I did wanna um, uh, acknowledge, uh, Bryn suggested that, hey, a lot of us are talking about validation in this call. We could probably have a separate discussion about that. Um, and I'd love to do that. I, I have some thoughts on validation too. So we can uh, I put that on my list of stuff for next times. Um, thanks. And um, okay, so last demo here. Um, well, I put together the curl demo while we were talking because it was actually really easy and Seth told me exactly what to type. So I'm gonna show that. And then, um, okay, so here's, here's the curl demo. I just subscribed to that same Invisible College chat server, this URL here. And you do curl dash eight subscribe, keep alive. And it just, it printed out this, this is the current version of it. And then I added a new message and here's the new message. And so that's what you see. So in a sense, oh, now we got a new one. <laughs> Thank you for helping me so I don't have to type as much, do the demo, making it really live, this is great. And um, thank God that it didn't break when someone did that. Um, Anyways, that's what it looks like curl already works in a sense, but it doesn't show you the current version because it doesn't know how to interpret patches and everything. Um, and that's, that's maybe probably the difference between this and Seth's watch.js. Emojis work too, awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, um, last demo is, um, so, well, this is a weird state. Let's, let's connect this network. So. Um, Part of our goal here is to get synchronization embedded everywhere by default so that when you're programming, instead of like right now when you program, you make some local variables by default. And if you wanna connect that over the network, you write some networking code and that's a pain in the butt. What if everything was just synchronized by default and had a full on CRDT or operational transform implementation, the greatest synchronizer? Um, well, the reason you don't wanna do that today is that it takes some performance overhead, there's a hit on that. And so you don't wanna have all your variables do that. Um, but if we had um, a nice pruning algorithm that could prune out the history, then you wouldn't, you could probably enable the stuff by default, at least a lot more stuff. So um, we've been working for a long time. There, there are, uh, until now, there have been no peer-to-peer -peer synchronizers that can prune their history. Uh, that can figure out how much to prune their history. Because they always have the possibility that some peer, like this guy, <laughs> will reconnect to the network based on some old version of history. Like he hasn't seen any of these updates. And then when he reconnects, he has to be able to, um, if he made some edits while offline, then he's gonna have to send those edits over, which means they're gonna have to track back to a common fork point. And it's been, that's a difficult problem to solve to understand how far back in history you have to, you know, you have to save onto, and to figure out which things, which parts of history you can remove. Um, but uh, we've solved this problem, and it's very exciting to us. This is a visualization of the algorithm, and we can see over time. So it's it's gonna. Well, I'm gonna turn off. It keeps. Turn, let, let's make it stop breaking, <laughs> breaking the network connections. Okay, now we should see everything resolve back down to zero. Let's turn the edits down. So once all these network messages finish going, uh, oh, okay, that was last, there we go. So now everything dropped back down. So this is the state of memory now, it's just a string. And so we're able to get overhead down to zero after all the acknowledgements go through. And so this has some additional messages that go over the protocol. You can see one of them is, see these green things, they get darker over time. And these are acknowledgements. And there's two phases of acknowledgements that go out, bloop. Uh, okay, this is the last phase. Um, and there's, so we have a couple phases of acknowledgements that have to go out. And then another thing that happens is when you break a connection, it sends these little, we call them fissures. And this is telling everybody that there was a break in the network. If you reconnect, then it'll broadcast the opposite side of that fissure. And so we call this an antimatter algorithm because these fissure are, it's kind of like these matter and antimatter particles. And they, go across the network and then when two nodes reconnect, they transmit the other side of that fissure, the other particle, and it will, whenever two of them come together, they will annihilate each other. And so you can have interesting features like, so now we've got two fissures over here. Um, let's, this one has a cycle, let's break this connection. 
And let's turn the network seed, speed way down so you can watch it. So now you can see those fissure particles going across and boom. So they just cleared off here. And now here's the opposite one for this one. And it clears off and that one clears off. And so the network, no peer has to be aware of the entire shape of the network. It just sends out these antimatter particles to each other and it'll just do the right thing. You can connect it over here. Let's turn the network speed back up. And so now we just saw a bunch of these fissures disappear because this guy had them, had the other side. And so he's like, okay, we're now reconnected so we can prune that old history. But there's a new fissure due to this connect, th this disconnect. We connect these guys back together. Then now all those guys clear out. And so these are the markers that are used in the algorithm that help it figure out which parts of history it can prune out. Um, so just wanted to give you guys an update on this algorithm. Um, you know, this, this algorithm, by the way, for the, um, the acknowledgements, like let's, well, maybe I can just type some things here. Um, so those, those acknowledgements are gonna, are flowing back. Um, you can also use these acknowledgements for validation, interestingly. Um, so they're, they're useful for a couple different things, um, but this is all kind of in the, the level three protocol spec. And so at some point we can talk about all that stuff. Uh, this is the last demo. Any questions on this? This is the first time I'm seeing this. It's amazing. Like I almost want to play it like a video game. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, uh, I guess a couple of questions. First is just contextual because I'm like, my mind is racing like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? This is so cool. Um, is this like, so is bloop.monster a special thing that lets you do this? Or what is, what are we looking at here? Bloop.monster is Greg's site. Um, you're gonna have to, this is Greg's hacking site. And it okay. has, right. happens to have this file hosted here, but um, this is all just client side simulation. It's not doing anything over the network. It's just simulating okay. a bunch of peers that are all communicating So cool. Jointly. I love, I love uh, legible um, academic work. <laughs> this is really cool. <laughs> Um, and the second question, uh, more to do with the protocol itself, is um, does this assume a closed set of peers? Um, not, uh, so no peer has to know all of the other peers. Okay, so that's one way in which it's not closed. Um, any new peer can join. Um, there is one limitation, uh, which maybe we could work around, but we've, we're going with it, which is when you start off in the network, there has to be a single peer that created the first edit. And then whenever you join the network, you, you become kind of, and this, is, this feels a lot like, um, like a group of friends. You become a part of the group when you join. And everyone basically promises to be able to send you enough information um, or to hold on to enough information so that you can merge each other's edits. So it is okay. closed in the sense that uh, it's a growing closed set, right? It's a growing closed set, although you can also reject people. Okay. Okay. So uh, once you've already accepted them before in the past? Yeah. So here's a little fissure ob object. We've got this little purple guy. Mm. And this is going to freeze some versions in history and say we can't delete those. Um, but if at some point we're over here and we're like, I don't care about these people anymore, okay, we can just delete that fissure. And now we won't be able to merge perfectly. I mean, that's, that's the cost. And any peer can deter, decide at any point that they want to give up on some other cool. subnetworks. Cool. Right. So it's yeah, configurable in the sense that um, you may have a policy that says we don't care about peers after a day or something like that and just exactly. remove them. OK, very yeah. cool. Wow, really cool. Or, or peers that come from IP addresses that are sketchy. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well then, um, so oh, let's click the share button again and pull up our agenda. Okay, so we've got um, two items slated on our discussion section. We've got a discussion of pat patch formats, and we've had a lot of conversation on the mailing list about patch formats and merge types. And um, so this will probably be a pretty juicy one to go through, but Bryn in particular uh, suggested brought this up for today's agenda. So Bryn, maybe you could lead us there. And we've also got 
you know, fitting our work together. And that's also um, a Bryn topic, but I think we've already been getting into it in this conversation too. So um, do you want to lead us, Bryn? Is the plan still to end in half an hour? Yeah, that's, that's still the plan. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, I don't have anything formal prepared, but Let's see if I can just kind of unpack the, the problem I've been encountering. So our, our patches are sort of like opcodes in a sense. Um, they are basically the, small, the smallest unit of computation that, uh, that exists in, in the braid system. And basically what I was running into, and this was about a year ago, I've been meaning to have this discussion for way too long. Um, Essentially, like I, I was trying to write validators uh, for bundles of patches. And in simple cases like, uh, you know, I don't know, like a, a user profile state tree or something, it, it's pretty easy to just say like, oh, if you're writing to, uh, you know, slash users slash Bryn, but you're actually Mike, reject it. That's simple enough. But as, as the complexity of the application increases, uh, it becomes a lot more cumbersome and, and difficult to understand the semantic intent of the of the bundle of patches. And I mean, yeah, you you can like you can define a certain closed set of patch bundles, I guess you could call them, or transactions is how I'm thinking of them, uh, in your application. But that doesn't stop, um, you know, because we're we're talking about creating multiple UIs for the same uh, the same application. So, like, what if somebody creates a UI that doesn't adhere to your exact um, closed set of, of transaction types? Um, so, you have to account for a lot of different sort sort of an open ended set of cases as far as the patches that are coming in. And it occurred to me that since patches are kind of like opcodes, um, maybe there's like a higher level at which we can uh, express that semantic intent and then do the validation using that. And then what will happen then is that uh, we'll have some kind of like, I don't know, mapping function that will take those more uh, human understandable transaction types and then convert them into, their, into the opcodes that they represent and then feed those into the resolvers. Does that make sense? This is the first time I've spoken to human beings about this. So, <laughs> well, um, I'm I, let me, I'm trying to restate what I'm hearing, and okay. also I I think um, if you have the ability to like maybe write up like some mm -hmm. examples in some text and then share your screen while we're going through this, that might be really helpful so, to have something concrete to look at. Um, my understanding is that you let's say you're writing a server, a braid server. And you're like, well, people can define their own patch formats. So there could be lots of different ways that someone might express a patch to me. And now I want to write some validation code that is able to accept a patch and determine if this is allowed or not. And if I have to express that validation code according to a whole bunch of different patch types, then you know, if I have like, if I'm trying to support n different patch types, then I have to write n validation functions. And I want to avoid that. I think that is the problem. Um, that is also a problem, um, but the problem that I'm talking about is one that exists even if you have one, uh, just one patch format that you support uh, in your application. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put together an example here. Let me see if I can share my screen and we can just do this together. Uh, where is that? Here we go. Are you all seeing that? Looks good. OK. Um, yeah, I was kind of scratching my head for examples. Uh, let's see if this works. So a typical that's transaction. A, oh, sorry, what was it? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the dimmest text editor I've ever seen. Oh, really? <laughs> um, hey, can you bump the font size up just for the recording? Yeah. How's that? Yeah, great. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Let's just. So 
let's say that one front end you can always kind of expect will, uh, you know, when somebody deposits money or something like that, it'll always send exactly this patch bundle with the uh, appropriate values in it. But because we can't guarantee that there's only one front end talking to this, um, you might have another one that sends this only and like doesn't do the update timestamp or, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you see what I mean though? Like you can't really guarantee what the exact patch bundle is that, uh, that the protocol is gonna have to validate. So this I reminds me a little bit of how video games work that like, you know, if we're playing Overwatch, you don't trust my web browser. Uh, sorry, you don't trust my game client to not yeah. lie about things. So instead of saying like this object moved to this location, instead my client says, um, I type these key inputs. Uh, and then the server figures out what the world looked like on my computer and then determines what the operation was and then applies that operation at that point in time as if I sent that operation. But then the only thing I can send is like what my inputs are. So actually I can't cheat because, well, mm -hmm. you know, cheating would have to be via reverse engineered via sending like very precise input inputs to the game. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I think that's a great analogy. Um, so yeah, yeah. So this is kind of a, a fairly weak example because this actually would be pretty easy to validate. I will, um, on the mailing list, I'll come up with something more complex. But what, I, what I'm proposing basically is that, uh, like let's take Redwood, for example, the thing that that the client will transmit to Redwood will not be, uh, you know, just a, a transaction with patches in it, but rather will be um, something like like that. And then inside of your uh, inside of your, it's going to need a new stage because it it right now it goes validator then merge resolver, and I think what I'm saying is that we need validator. Uh, opcode generator or patch generator and then merge resolver. And so that middle layer would be something like this. So I think I see what you're saying. I my my concern with this is that um uh yeah so I could imagine sharing that function and then having the peer like run the function locally and then um, and then send the operation. When it gets around to merging the operations together, we're always gonna have to be like, either you have to write, like you don't wanna be merging, you, you know, like deposit amount. You wanna be merging that operation, right? Like dot deposit mm -hmm. users dot amount equals whatever, um, because that's the language that the merger, merge types are gonna actually be understanding and interpreting. So if the merge resolver has to do that, then it's gonna be a bit tricky. Like. You can't, you can't just send around deposit amount everywhere, right? Like that needs to be turned into the operation so that it can be merged. Mm -hmm. And if it gets turned into the operation and so it gets merged, if you're sending around the resulting patch, then the application could just send around the resulting patch itself anyway, um, which makes it all a little bit tricky. Yeah. Maybe I could uh, comment on a, a reframing of this. Um, we, so Braid supports multiple patch types. I mean, you can put anything you, you want in there. Um, there is the, the, the format that you're putting in here at the top that fits the range patch type, which is a very general mm -hmm. patch. It just says this region was replaced with this value. Um, so you, in general, any peer, any server, any client can choose which, it has to choose which patch types it's gonna support both for inputs and for outputs. And when you're building an application, um, especially if you're not using a great kernel, you know, with great, great library software, if you're just writing these things by hand, um, then you can require not just like a particular patch type as in like, maybe we're just using these range patches, but you can also say the only types of patches that are allowed is like a version that has maybe, like if you're depositing an amount, then you have to also update the timestamp. And you can go ahead and require that on your server and just reject that second transaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, that's, no. so that's totally fine to do. At some level, every server and client is, can constrain which patch types they accept. Mm -hmm. What you have in this next version with this deposit one, two, three, that is another type of patch. You yeah. know, so now you're defining a patch type, but this is a patch type that's specific to your application. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you know, 
there, there is a benefit in just using generic patch types that others can use. Because for instance, if they don't care about getting perfect merging or they just wanna be able to like get a rough idea of what's happening, um, then they can still interpret the patch types. You know, or if they don't do any validation, then they can still interpret it. So you can have like a proxy that's just sitting there staying up to date with the JSON, even if it doesn't do any validation. Mm -hmm. And so there's some, there's some value in using generic patches. Um, but I think at the high level, and um, at the high level, the question is, what constraints do you want to have in your server and your client? And you don't have to support. So you, you said like, if my server requires only these types of patches, what happens if a client is giving me changes in a different format? And you can just not support that client or say, hey, mm -hmm. client, if you want to connect to my server, put your patches in this form. And we don't have right now like a way to specify that. Like that'd be a really cool thing to add into the protocol, maybe a header that, so that when you're connecting to it, you know like the specific types of patches that are allowed. And in the long distance future, once we have super generic kernels that are widespread and everywhere, then maybe we can just do anything and the whole thing can be much easier to program. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, no, I, I think that speaks to one of the strengths of, of Braid is, is that even when I was encountering this problem, it was obvious to me that the protocol allows for a solution like this um, without any modification. Uh, I mainly wanted to bring it up just to kind of to vet the idea and the approach. And, you know, since we're talking about interoperability, if I were to go this direction, say, with one of my apps, and then you wanted to build a client, then you would have to factor that in as well. Um, so yeah, I just mainly wanted to kind of get it out there in the open. This seems really similar to the problem of merging code, where uh, some, somebody might update a file and then submit a patch request, or sorry, a pull request. And then uh, the code maintainer may say, well, um, this looks good, but you also have to update the documentation for, for this to be accepted. Um, is I, I guess I'm wondering, is this sort of like maybe the beginning of a, like you've, you've already mentioned the word transaction, which I find really interesting. Um, that feels to me very similar to a, a branch or a pull request or something like that, that has like several pieces that are all sort of lumped together and then on the whole can be validated and merged in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So a transaction just contains one or more patches and they're understood to sort of uh, be like an atomic unit. And that's equivalent to a version in the braid mm -hmm. spec. It's mm -hmm. a, a different word. A version also is an atomic unit that has one or more patches. Mm -hmm. So in um, braid, do we have, can we have multiple patches that refer to the same version? Yeah, and that's what a version is. A version has multiple patches. I, I always think about it as a version named state. So the state of the entire world is named by this version. And then when the state changes, the version has to change as well. But the state of the world could change by multiple different documents all changing at once to be able to produce that new version. Like if I make a change to two documents, then there's, you know, if it's in a transaction, if it's in an atomic transaction, there's no point in time where one of the documents has changed, but the other one hasn't changed yet. That's not a valid state. There's the state where neither of them have changed and then the state where both of them have changed. Um, but, you know, the, the, the middle never happens. That's, that's the rule of, you know, well, acid. Yeah. Um, so yeah. is, is um, that, does that help? Maybe I'm still misunderstanding the problem, Bryn. The sense sounded like um, part of the problem here is that the step at which the validation needs to happen is um, not being properly represented uh, by the patches coming in. Yeah, the problem, I guess, the way I would frame it is that determining the intent, is that the right way to put it? Hmm. I guess oh, it's yeah. not really about intent. It's, it's, it's more that if you could have any set of patches coming in simultaneously, it becomes kind of cumbersome to do validation on those because sometimes uh, the ways that those updates interact with one another can be, um, I, I, I need to get you guys an example, I guess, to make it clear. The, there's, I a, sorry, Greg. I have a question that might, I don't know, help me under at least understand um, what you're getting at. 
Uh, would it be, so here's a question, would it be uh, equivalent to you, would it achieve your, would it satisfy your, your issue uh, if in those top two transactions, um, you added another patch that was kind of a kind of a bogus patch that basically said the deposit parenthesis one two three like just mm. a, a patch that kind of says what the intent of the group of patches together is and then you could have an if statement around that in your validator that mm -hmm. would look at that and then it would know what the rest of the things we're trying to do but is it that does that get at the the problem that you're trying to solve here is the problem that if you get just a group of patches that it's programmatically kind of difficult to know how to validate it because you kind of have to look at it to figure out what it's even trying to do to know which mm -hmm. validation function to run. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a clearer way of stating it, yeah. And I agree I like that that, that would probably, like just basically adding metadata, it sounds like. Um, but then also including the patches. I mean, I think that could work. You would, you'd have to check to make sure that those two things matched, that like that deposit one, two, three actually should produce the patches that you sent along with it. But that doesn't seem like it would be very hard to do. Um, ShadyB has a similar problem I had um, when I was working on it. Uh, and it's, I think people ended up with similar solutions um, to what you just suggested, Greg. So like, you know, in the client, you send an operation and then you can attach metadata to the operation, um, giving extra information. And then the server can have middleware uh, basically saying like, you know, run this function every time an operation comes in. So inside that, then that's how you do validation in ShadyB. It's just all middleware. So it's just like, great, you got this operation in from this client with this metadata, um, you know, is it acceptable or not? And then of course the middleware can decide to throw it out or it can decide to pass it on. It can modify it in flight. It can do a bunch of different things. Um, and yeah, people ended up doing similar things to that, um, using the metadata property to say, hey, this is like some higher level semantic intent. And then that way they can use that to validate that the change itself is valid. I'll have to look into that. That, um, that sounds perfect. Yeah, I, I don't know they, if any documentation on that particular approach. Yeah, couldn't they lie about the metadata? Uh, yeah, but you can check the operation matches what you'd expect um, in the metadata. Right. So, yeah. Um, so the other the other problem here, I mean, like, Bryn, you need to you need to meet PVH. <laughs> you just need to freaking do it. <laughs> He's been hanging out for the past kind of couple of days on the um, on our new Braid Discord, and there's been a whole bunch of talk about Cambria. Um, mm. Incidentally, like to the point that someone was like, "Hey, isn't this supposed to be Braid Chat, not Cambria Chat?" <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, he he's been thinking about it this a lot from the perspective of if we've got a distributed network of, uh, of data. I can imagine like two people, you know, like me and Mike both making different clients that both have different code in them and both share the same data model. And he's been thinking about it as like, you know, the other half of this problem, which is, you know, now Mike wants to add an extra field to chat messages. Like Mike wants to add emoji to chat messages. Well, my client doesn't support emoji on chat messages. So how does that work? Like, what does that look like in the data model? Because obviously, you know, the answer isn't that Mike has to go and change your client's source code. Well, he doesn't have access to that. Um, but Mike still wants his emoji to work and my client needs to keep on working with Mike's chat messages. And ideally I should just not see the emoji pop up. Right. Um, so anyway, he's got his, I don't know if you, have you read the Cambria paper, Bryn? No, no. Okay. It might be worth a read. Um, but yeah, he's got a whole approach with lenses and so on to oh, okay. kind of deal with this. Cool. So we've, we've got 10 minutes left now. So let's, um, let's, let's cut to the last item of discussion is how we're all working together. And um, we've had some discussion on that already. And in this, we can also, I, th I think, think about uh, how we can conclude this meeting. This is our, our first time all meeting together. And I, a lot of ideas have come up for things for us to talk about next. So um, I just wanna put out a request. If you've had ideas during this meeting of things to talk about, write them down and then reply to the email thread. And we'll, we can add those to the agenda for the, the upcoming meetings. And, um, and then, you know, let's just also, so, well, maybe Bryn, you could start us with um, your thoughts about working together. Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing that occurs to me is that, uh, 
we have three JavaScript clients. Um, I would really love to uh, relinquish mine and have somebody who's more of a JavaScript person take that on. Um, we also, it sounds like, have uh, Redwood, which is in Go. We have, um, I think somebody mentioned on the mailing list they wanted to start writing a Go uh, implementation. And then there was somebody else who looked like they had a company that has something similar but doesn't use Braid yet. Um, so if we could kind of deduplicate efforts there, that would be really helpful. I think it would move all of, all of this stuff forward more quickly uh, and pull us out of our silos. Um, so yeah, I, I, th that's basically my starting point, um, but I'm not sure how other people feel about combining at this stage. So sharing code seems like the main thing, like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're already doing, we're checking a lot of the other boxes, I think, just by having meetings like this and uh, working on the, the spec. Cool, so I guess my, my understanding of the JavaScript clients is that um, none of them are perfect or great yet. And maybe it's the case of like, without having a thing that's like off the shelf ready to use, people are kind of writing their own thing and exploring it. But I think we probably definitely want to get to having a reference implementation that's full featured and generally useful. And we're probably not that far away from it either. Um, I guess, Seth and Dwayne, is that, does that match your feelings on, you've been writing some JavaScript code too? Yeah, I think, um... I am seeing divergence still, so there is some there are some differences. I'm not sure if our tooling would necessarily just automatically work together at this phase, but um, I definitely like the idea of a reference implementation. I think that would be a good uh, effort um, to start. I, I don't know which of the three JavaScript libraries that we have going should be the the beginning, but um, uh, yeah. So so far, I've been working on set or working with Ceph's um, Braid protocol. Uh, code most just out of preference because I understand it, but <laughs> there may be other things that um, that are working better in other branches. Yeah, my take is just that like the code's just not very big and complicated. Like the protocol is actually pretty simple and my implementation of the code is what, 60 lines in the client and the server, somewhere around that. So like if we end up with three implementations, each of which is about 60 lines, that's not the end of the world, you know, it's like a, half hour to goof around with it. Um, I think it would be good to have an official version that we can say like, you know, recommend people, you know, hey, want to use Node.js? Like here's our recommended NPM module to the client and to the server. I think that'd be great. Um, but uh, yeah, a bit in terms of implementations, like I think, I've got that and I'll go for it. Uh, I think there is some risk though, if we, if we um, say that this is the reference implementation and it doesn't do what people expect, um, there is some risk there of like disappointing. Um, uh, I think we have sort of this internal um, knowledge about how there's the protocol and the kernel and maybe something else after that. Uh, uh, it, it might be helpful to sort of label what this shared reference implementation can do because my, my understanding is if it's 60 lines of code, that's not actually gonna merge, for example, um, may not actually provide that functionality. Yeah, in my repo, I don't know if you read the readme, but my goal is to be like, okay, we've got those levels that Mike was talking about earlier, you know, and I'm imagining the website, right, for Braid being like, hey, we've got a protocol for doing state synchronization of HTTP, like, you know, the goal is like to be able to reach, have a protocol that can reach from, you know, synchronize a single value from a server to the clients, all the way through to like have a distributed system that can be able to have, you know, data that's collaboratively editable and merged by multiple peers, you know, you know, here's all the different use cases, right? You know, I am, I just have a single value on my server and I want to be able to synchronize it between peers, right? Okay, great. Here's what you do. You use the simple library, you pull it into the browser like this. This is how you use it. it. Works fine. Okay, cool. I want to have like operations and be able to do versions and so on. Great. Well, that same library, it turns out if you use it like this, this is how that works. Here you go. You know, cool. I want to have a peer to peer network. Okay, great. Well, if you want to do that, then, you know, have you, you should have a look at Redwood. You know, this library that we have, it does not implement the peer to peer stuff. But Redwood will do a lot of the groundwork for that, or like this other thing that Seth's working on, you know, this little braid database. Um, you'll need a more complicated system that actually handles your data to be able to have a full peer-to-peer -peer system. And like that's what I'm imagining. And so 
yeah, hence in that little repo, I was like, great, I want examples of each of these different cases of like, this is how you would use code to be able to do that we can pull in later. But um, that's my image for it. It really occurs to me that we can put a lot of this explanation on the web page. On braid.news right now, we list a bunch of implementations as a bulleted list, and we don't really describe much about the differences or when you'd use one or the other. And um, so that's a big, I'll, I'll, I'll try to work on that. And we can all work on that too. By the way, if you want um, to edit the, the, web, the homepage, let me know, you'll get an account and you can just edit it in the web like a wiki. Um, I, I do have a hard stop on the hour um, since I've got, it's Australia day today and I've got some few minutes. Um, wondering if there's anything else before we wrap up. Well, let's do it then. We can end early. Um, that'd be pretty quick, <laughs> like two minutes. Um, I, I'll just add a little conclusion and anyone else wants to conclude, you feel free to as well. I'm, I'm really stoked actually to see us all coming together and like a whole bunch of stuff just came to mind about what we need to work on next. So I think our priorities are getting a lot more clear from this conversation. Let's keep having them. I'm gonna post my notes onto the thread on the mailing list. Um, just with my takeaways, it'd be great to see your takeaways as well. Cool. Thanks everyone. Um, and yeah, we'll do this again in two weeks. So take care. All right, bye everyone. See you guys around. Thanks.